Hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard Hall here on, uh, from Stonehenge RTRO and this is our uh, night sky that we'll be doing. Uh, I don't have Kay with me tonight because of school holidays, we've got plenty of things happening out at Stonehenge at the moment. Uh, but I do have Keith unfortunately, hello Keith. Unfortunately yes, <laughs> I'm still here, you can't get rid of me. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, well, we be we better get on with it. I always like to thank Dan Broughton, who supports this, from Wirepper Web Designer, who always supports uh, this program that we're running, which is about the rest of the universe, right? Anyway, I, I guess I'd better better start off with this. Some of this stuff we've seen on TV lately uh, about these sphericals that they've been digging up from a meteorite that struck the Earth, and it appears that the or the path of that uh, meteorite shows it would came from beyond the solar system and they've been digging up underneath the water these sphericals and as you can see some of them you're watching it on tv you can see these little balls there of metal uh, and the, the quantity of different metals and, and particularly different types of metals is simply absolutely unusual so uh, in other words you're talking about an alien visitor from interstellar space from beyond the well that's what the, well, there's the stars. been a suggestion that is actually a space or a probe that's entered the atmosphere <laughs> of the earth that's what has been suggested yeah. now this is not the only uh thing that's happened uh, a few years ago there was a, a um, an asteroid that came in because most of the, let's go back most of the stuff that we see like uh, meteors and that in the night sky a lot of that originates from the asteroid belt where there's been collisions and stuff get swept in it's unusual to get something from deep space well there was this asteroid that came in uh, a couple of years ago mm. and it its path showed it come from interstellar space but not only that as it passed went round the sun and out again past the earth and so on it appeared to have a really unusual shape to it which I'm showing on there elongated and we don't normally find not at rocks that particular shape you usually know? sort of rounded or potato shape but that's right this, but this one's shaped like a, a like big a, long like cigar a, isn't it like a french loaf <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's right and of course uh, yeah. the other thing that suggested i'm not so certain that as it went out of the solar system it actually began to accelerate mm. and of course natural bodies cannot do that so the suggestion by some people is that what we were looking at probably looked, looked more like that for the voice on TV. In other yes. words, it was, wasn't a lump of rock, it was some sort of thing from an alien world beyond the solar it's system. It's a scout ship, alien, <laughs> an alien scout ship. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, of course, there's almost certainly other life forms out there, but there's such great distances. We'll have a chat about that a little later as, as we go along. So let's get back into our night sky, first mm. of all. Um, Oh, there's the bright star people keep on asking me about is the this bright star they can see is actually the evening star is actually the planet Venus all right which every couple of years we'll see in our evening sky but after a while it's going to dis rapidly disappear again mm. so that's the evening star there okay what I want to continue with is what we were looking at last last program we were looking at the southern night sky particularly the southern cross uh, but I want to continue in that area and what's coming up for those of you on uh, TV now is the night sky as we see around right about six o'clock in the evening uh, looking due south and what we can see is we've got the scorpion rising up in the east uh, which is the sign of winter it's going to dominate the night sky throughout the winter evening and disappearing in the west is our sign of summer orion that's early just six o'clock in the evening orion will be gone the scorpion will get higher uh, but due south at this time at its highest point in the sky is the southern cross followed by the two pointer stars which follow it around the sky now okay we had a close look at this last time uh, and we look at the southern cross but this time <laughs> i want to look at what the southern cross but actually the two pointer stars now the, the less bright of the two is a gina right and it is 525 light years away now this is something we have to bear in mind when we look at the night sky we're not seeing the common or garden variety of, of star out there what we're tended to see is giant stars which shine out over thousands of light years all right and here's a gina um, it's a blue giant star it's 16,000 times brighter than the sun all right that's why we can see it so bright over over 500 light years all right yes yeah 
So it's a really hot blue star, okay? And that applies to most of the big bright stars that you can see in the sky. They will be giant stars. However, next to uh, Agena, the brightest of the two pointer stars is different from the average star that we can easily see with the unaided eye because it's actually bright because it's actually so close to us it's actually a nearby ordinary star it's just 4.3 light years away yeah that's very very close as uh, as still the distances go that's basically living in the same house yeah but <laughs> that's right it, <coughs> is, it is it is very very close to us so and there are quite a lot of stars quite close to us that alpha centauri is actually the closest but most of them uh not very noticeable with the unaided eye all right now but the interesting thing is even if you look at it in a small telescope the first thing you notice is it's a glorious double star hmm. and this is where things differ from our our solar system we've only got one sun and the planets orbit around it but the alpha centauri system has got two suns all right and let's have a look at them I've, what i've brought up for you uh watching this on tv is an image of the sun and next to it, we can see two scale, and look at the physical size yes. of the scale, is Jupiter, the biggest planet. And that little tiny dot you can see there is our planet Earth, which you could fit over a million of them inside the orb of the sun. Yes. Yeah. But, of course, it's very, very important. It's a little world. It's a rocky planet, orbits around the sun. And essentially, the planets, a lot of them, appear to be just a debris left over from the formation of our sun. And so we expect that we've always expected to find that planets around other stars. Mm. It's just that our technology hasn't been good enough to detect them. But that's tended we're, to change now. Yes, we're start we're starting to get there. We um, we've been using Earth orbiting satellites yeah. to detect. Yeah. Um, Earth-sized rocky planets yeah. in orbit around other stars. Yeah, well, in yes. the actual fact that as over several thousands of planets have now been discovered around yeah. other stars. Most of them that have been discovered at the moment are giant planets like Jupiter. As you can mm. imagine, if somebody out there trying to look at our solar system, it, with their technology is like ours, they could perhaps detect Jupiter. Detecting Earth is a little bit more difficult. But as our technology goes on, as Keith is saying, we, we tend to find more and more of these Earth-like planets out there. Okay. All right, now what I've brought up now for you on watch on TV is the Alpha Centauri system to scale in physical size. Now, the two stars orbit around each other in a period of 79 years and the distance between them varies between uh, just over 11 astronomical units which is about the distance between the uh, sun and saturn and 35 and a half astro astronomical units yes. the distance between the sun and neptune so this means that it, both of these stars could have planets but they wouldn't be as extensive as ours because otherwise they'd just be unstable but if you put the Earth around either one of those suns, it would be actually uh, quite stable. So the inner planets could be. Yes, the, the orbit around two suns like that, a planet or trying to orbit two suns, it would be a much more complicated orbit. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, that's when you've uh, been, if it's just at the right spot, you could have this, this figure of eight orbit. Yes, yes. But the other, of course, what would make it very, very difficult for a planet doing that, those planets would always have to remain at the same distance. But as I've just mentioned, the orbit of these two stars is elliptical and the, the distance between them varies by a factor of about three. So, yes. yeah. So that wouldn't be possible on that. So there's the, that's the bright stars of Alpha Centauri. And let's have a look at them in, in a little bit more detail. We've got names for them. Arigel Kentaurus. Um, is the brighter of the two now it's just it's very very similar to the sun but just slightly hotter and about 50 percent brighter than our sun all right and its diameter is 23 percent larger as well the second star Ptolemon, is a little bit cooler it's more of an orangey type cut star and its amount of energy it emits is about 50 percent that of the sun but both of them are very could very well support they're very sun like and they could support exactly. earth like planets um now i'd like to point out to the um stellar classifications in that um uh roger Cantaris is a g1 v star Ptolemon is a k1 v star very simply the g and the k um are a rather uh, peculiar alphabet that was invented 
uh, to determine the colour temperature of the stars, uh, that being the uh, you know the, um, the M type stars or small uh, red stars or either the big red giants, um, the O and the B stars are the huge blue uh, giants which are very very hot. The colour uh, tells you the temperature, and they invented a classification which tells you roughly what the uh, what the surface temperature of that star is. Well, you've got two yeah. factors there. You've got first of all, it says G one. Or G2. Our, our sun is G2, mm. and then after that is a, a number, it says V, and that means that they are normal main sequence stars that, just like our sun, are burning hydrogen. Yes. If you see a different figure behind that, it, it will probably mean it's a more evolved star or something like that. Yes. We may see that a little bit later on. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid we haven't got any K stars here at the moment, okay? Yep. She's had to stay back. <laughs> So okay. <laughs> the V means it's a main sequence star, yeah. burning hydrogen, just like our, just our, like sun, our yeah. sun. So yes. that, that quick classification can tell you exactly what the nature of that st particular star is. Yes. Now, there's good indications from observations being made that planets exist around both of those stars. Right? We suspect there could be, but we're actually beginning to prove that they are. So can you imagine, however, being on a planet, shall we say, going around Ptolemon, and you've got two suns, <laughs> and yes. uh, uh, yeah, I've mentioned a, a sunset where you've got two stars, one setting after the other. And depending where you're on your orbit, sometimes you're in the middle, you've got as one star sets, the other one rises. So you've got 24 hours of brightness, and so on. another yes. time you've got both of them in the sky together. Yeah, it'd be interesting, wouldn't it? So sunrises and sunsets are very complicated. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> okay, so that's time. Okay, so. But the interesting thing is that if Alpha Centauri is a binary star system, but it's actually not exactly the closest star to us. And for those of you watching this on TV, you can see us put an arrow up. Some distance away from Alpha Centauri is another star called Proxima. Now, this star cannot be seen with the unaided eye because it's too faint, right? But it's in fact the closest star to the solar system. Its distance is just four and a quarter light years, slightly diff more cl closer to us than yep. Alpha is. In fact, it's so close to Alpha that some uh, astronomers suggested it is actually a part of the system. And it orbits around the other two in a period of about half a million years. I right? have a very long orbital period. Yeah, yeah half a million. Now, I've just pulled up Proxima to scale as well, and you can see how small it is. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than Jupiter, right? Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's the amount of energy. This is a small red star, but don't think this is unusual. This is one of the common stars in the galaxy. It's just that they are so faint. They're small. See, the bigger a star is, the less common it is, right? Yes. So giant stars like Agena are very rare, right? Proxima-type stars are very common. Uh, but it's only about, it sends out about one twenty thousandth the luminosity of the sun. That's why don't, we don't see it very well, okay? Yes. Yeah. Can it be seen in a telescope, Richard? Yes, it can, but you need to know where to look. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah I've looked at it quite a few times, you know, yeah. So that's, that's Proxima there. But the interesting thing about Proxima, studying it, we now know that it definitely has planets around it, right? Yes. Uh, Probably at least three, I think, have been detected. Um, and what we do is, is, is not very, we don't give them wonderful names at the moment, like Saturn or Jupiter. We call it Proxima Centauri B, A yep. being the star, and yes. B being the other one, okay? And for those of you having a look at, um, look at this on uh, TV, you can see this beautiful sunset with Proxima there. And it, up in the sky also, you've got the other two stars of Alpha Centauri together. So it'll be a magnificent sunset we you'll be watching at that time, okay? Yes. Now, the interesting thing is the mass of this star is only slightly large, oh, sorry, of this planet is only slightly larger than the Earth. Its orbital distance, however, is much closer than the sun. It's only seven, seven and a half million kilometers from the surface of the star, which it orbits around every 11.2 days. And that's why we've been able to detect it because it moves around so rapidly. In the so the orbital period is the year. Yeah, of, of, of that's course. Right, yeah. So a year on this planet 
would be 11, 11, just day. over 11 days. That's right, yeah. That's, so that, it's all that's the things that we days. take for granted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And there also appears to be another one, a super Earth, right? At a distance of 220 million kilometers from it. That's not even, the, that's around about the orbit of Mars is of slightly less than the orbit of Mars is around the Earth, and there seems to be a super Earth. And by super Earth, we mean it's a planet, it's not a gas giant like uh, Neptune or <laughs> Jupiter or something like that. This is a rocky planet, but it's probably maybe twice the mass, up to twice the mass of the, uh, the Earth. So here, but at least we know there's Earth like planets out there, okay? Anyway, uh, Anna. We'll come. We'll come back to the map. I think what we should do is uh, have a little bit of music now. For what do you say, sir? Yes. Yes. I know he's brought his uh, long flute in. I brought my flute along. I'm still learning to play this, so there's going to be some funny notes. But um, and also, it's rather cold here in the studio. But. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Keith. So yeah. there you go. A little bit of music there from, coming from Proxima Centauri B. Yes. Now, the interesting thing about Proxima Centauri B, this planet we definitely know is there, right? If this is a very similar mass to the Earth, all right, uh, is it's in its distance shows us from the star that it's in the so called habitable zone. Now, this is a zone around a star where if you've got a planet like the Earth, liquid water could exist and therefore life as mm. we know it could exist this is the goldilocks zone it's the not gold. too hot and not too that's cold. right yeah yes. this is a habitable zone so yes. uh some people on particular on the internet are getting quite excited that we might have another earth there however there is a few basic problems with this particular star okay number one it is red this red dwarf is a flare star and periodically it, 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 you get gigantic eruptions on it, whereby the star can actually double in brightness. Yes. And of course, remember the planet's only about 7 million kilometres away. Yes. And as been pointed out by many scientists, it, all it has to be is blasted enough times and its entire atmosphere will be blasted off the planet. So th this uh, Proxima Centauri, it's a red dwarf star, but it's also a flare star and it produces at random, without any real warning, huge bursts of um, ultraviolet, visible light and ultraviolet radiation, mm. which can cause an awful lot of damage to any life forms on the uh, on the planet. Well, of course, our own sun has flares, yes. but not on this scale uh, compared yes. with the scale of the planet. The, po yes. the point is, uh, you know, we have big flares, and sometimes if we're in the path of them, like, that's when we see aurora and stuff like that as this that, stuff yes. arrives. Yes. But this 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 planet, in order to be warm enough to the, you know, to have liquid water in the habitable zone, <laughs> yes. it's sitting only seven million, yes. seven and a half million kilometres away. But one thing I'm thinking of, Richard, is that life, uh, life can evolve and life can be incredibly tough. And I'm thinking of these creatures on this planet. If there are, if there is life, um, they actually not only uh, protect themselves mm -hmm. from the ultraviolet flares they actually use the energy to drive their uh, to drive their metabolism well, so, it, well, well, yeah. Uh, well <laughs> yeah he said this energy is so powerful it's just about 
destroys anything, all molecules. But, yes. however, there's another important thing to remember. You see, if you look at our moon, right, the moon keeps the same face towards the Earth. Yes. And the reason is that it's much less a mass, and the tidal effect of the Earth has halted it so that this keeps the same face pointed That's towards... That's tidally locked. Yes. Well, this planet is almost certainly tidally locked to Proxima. It's so close to it. So what you've got is one side of the planet which is bathed in deadly radiation when there's a flare. Yes. The other side's in darkness, but there's a zone between the two yes. where things yeah. are... Goldilocks. Long, long the Terminator. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I would, I would never be looking at a flare star as a useful place to have a, a habitable planet. But this is just an example. This is just the nearest star to us, and we're finding all these other worlds. So look, in our galaxy, there must be billions and billions of worlds out there. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Okay. Right. Now let's imagine that we are, however, we're on a planet you know, around Proxima Centauri, and we're looking home. Uh, for those of you watching this, you can see Proxima setting over there. And above in the sky, we can see the two bright stars of uh, Alpha Centauri, which their orientation will continually change as they orbit around each other. All right? But what they would appear is like two brilliant stars, and I do mean brilliant. So yes. but they uh, return and... But, the night sky into broad daylight when they're up there okay but this planet we're assuming doesn't have atmosphere at this stage so that's the alpha centauri system there rigel kent and Tolliman, all right and there's the sun okay <laughs> now yes. from proxima this is the nearest star a planet around it our sun just appears as a bright star it doesn't even yes. it's not even the brightest star in the sky yeah about the same brightness of Procyon, uh, Procyon the uh, bright star in, in Canis Minor. Canis Minor, okay. yes. Yeah. But you could see our sun naked eye. Oh, from, yes. From, oh yes, yes, it'd be not, yeah. it'd be, it's a bright star, and it would be in the constellation, if we were using the same constellations, it's in the constellation Acacia Pier, which is yes. just the right, you can see that big W as it goes yes. down. Right. Basically, it would, be, it would be an extra star in Cassia Pier. That's yes, right, yeah, yeah, that's it. Now, the thing is, so we're, we, we sent someone out to Proxima. We're going to send a message. Hey, guys, we can see you here. <laughs> but remember that it's over at the Earth, the sun is over four light years away. So if you send a message once you arrived, it's over, it's 4.2 and a quarter light year, years yes. before it gets there. Before it gets back then to if it. they say, hey, great, can you send us a picture? <coughs> that message in turn takes over four years. <coughs> Excuse me. So don't imagine you can have a conversation here yes. because uh, when you send a message, by the time you get a reply, nine years have elapsed. So this puts satellite delay in, in, the, in the shade, doesn't it? You know, the, uh, it all, that slight it all, pause you get on, <laughs> on the phone when the other person answers, yes. That's right. Yes. And of course, what it does, it, it, it gets into trouble with a lot of the science fiction stories we t see which don't take any of this into account about empires and things like that. Yes. How could you run an empire where, you know, if it, hey, there's a, there's a revolt taking place on Earth and we're at Proxima. Yes. <laughs> By the time we learn about it, that's years ago. And, and this is just the nearest star, okay? Yes. This time thing is going to be a, a well, major... Of course, if you know your, your, your Earth history, the Romans had the same problem. Their empire was so great that... If there was trouble in one of the remoter outposts, it would take ages for um, for a message of the trouble to get uh, to get back to Rome. Yeah, and uh, so they had the same problem. Yeah, yes. that's right. So r running an empire like that is not easy, and uh, time and time dilation is something often people have a little bit of a problem with. All right, because we're talking about if you could travel at the speed of light. Of course, we know that you can't. Yes, and uh, because as you ex. Uh, there's some awesome things about relativity and nature of the universe we're in. And as you accelerate and you go it faster and faster, actually your mass increases. Yes. So if you weigh, I don't know how many pounds, right? Mm. Thinking tra tra travelling close to the speed of light, your weight would double. Just you, you wouldn't get fat or anything like that. Exactly. Just your mass would be increased. Yeah, the actual mass of, of, um, of yourself and your spaceship would become heavier and heavier the closer you yeah. get to uh, the speed of light. Now, if you could travel at the speed of light, 
the calculations showed that your mass would become infinite. Yes. Which means you would need an infinite amount of energy to propel it at that speed. Yes. <laughs> so we ain't going to get to the speed of light that way. Yes. The only possibility suggested by some scientists that we may find a, time, a way of leaping from one physical state to another. So you could travel from one point to the other. The only trouble is, whenever you do that, time slows down. So if you, if you could travel at the speed of light, time would be zero. In yes. other words, you could travel all the way to uh, Al uh, Alpha Centauri in just over four years. Uh, four years as per the people watching you on Earth, but you on, on the spacecraft, it would be uh, less than a second. Yes. Yeah. Right. This is because three things happen when you travel near the speed of light. Your weight, that is your mass, increases towards infinity. Your length contracts towards zero. Length, the actual physical length of the spaceship contracts towards zero and time slows down until at the speed of light time stops altogether and you remain frozen forever. So this, these are the reasons why you cannot travel at the speed of light. Now if you want mm. to extend that and say we're going to travel faster than the speed of light, mm. the reverse begins to happen. Time goes backwards. Yes. So in other words, if you were taking a journey to Alpha Centauri at greater than the speed of light, you would actually arrive there before you set out, if that makes sense at all. Yes, and this is the, uh, um, the effect beyond cause, uh, before cause rather. And a lot of people say, yeah, oh, yes. this is absolutely impossible, this is stupid, but do you know what recent uh, experiments, physics experiments in the United States, where they were just dealing with particles, where they could leap back for over the speed of light, Yes. They found exactly that. The particle arrived uh, <laughs> before yes. it was set out. A, so, fraction, a fraction before it's... That's before right, that yeah. it on its So journey. it's showing that That's, relativity, as yes. per Einstein predicted, is absolutely correct. Yes. So if we're going to travel around the universe, folks, we might have to use something a little bit different from what we've got at the moment. So that's it. We're set, we're just, and then we're just dealing with the... Uh, the uh, distances. Now, I've just brought up, we also, from looking at the comp chemical composition of these stars, we know that we can work out their ages. Our sun is 4.6 giga years or a billion years old, right? Yes. And that includes the planet because all form at the same time. Turns out Alpha Centauri is older, about 6 billion years. It's older. It's older yeah, than the yes. sun. Right. That means if something evolved on a planet there about the same time as us, mm -hmm. it would be well advanced of us. So civilization would be more advanced than, <laughs> than ours. Yeah, or, or gone or whatever, yeah. we don't know, okay? And Proxima, however, is an interesting thing, it's 4.85 giga years. This means it's older than the sun, but not as old as Alpha Centauri. Now yes. this means it can't have originally been a member of the system. So one possibility here is it's actually been captured been by the captured Alpha. By the gravity by the, of the yeah, Alpha. Yeah, that's right. Yes. So we ha if amongst our close relatives, we've got some really interesting things coming here. Okay, so we bring up our spaceship. Okay, how are we going to get there? Travel to it. Well, was that thing that arrived? And disappeared again was that some sort of probe from a distant star who I, knows who knows yeah, yeah. but, but it, 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 it certainly tempts the imagination it, make, it does oh, make you think absolutely yes and if, if you just think of the the pure scale of the universe i just put up a, a little pho photograph which has got the milky way in the background of stonehenge <laughs> and even when we see all the brilliant stars like that we just seen a small fraction of what's up there in the universe. In our galaxy alone, there's uh, 150,000 million stars. Remember, each of those is the sun. So the number of planets is enormous. And our galaxy is only one of millions of galaxies beyond that. So, yes. yeah, uh, there's more stars. It's planet there's definitely. more stars in the known universe than there are grains of sand, sand on all the beaches yes. there were and yes. probably 10 times as many worlds so boy yes. is there some things to discover it does, out there. it does certainly make you think that's yes. right yeah yes. now before I finish off i just got a couple of things uh we're we'll talking about something else i just to mention that stonehenge at the moment with school holidays open from 10 to 4 every day all right and uh we uh, you can also do uh guided tours uh, or a tour around space at night doing the stars. Yes. But these have to be booked, those particular things. 
okay? And also to point out that we've got Matariki coming up on Friday, July the 14th. At 4 p.m. we've got a special programme about Matariki and what it was all about. Uh, and which indeed the history of that goes back thousands and thousands of years. But there's also been some other great discoveries made and we're going to be discussing that in the near in the next programme about uh, dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter, dark energy and a brand new telescope in orbit around the Earth yeah. which has been designed to look for dark matter and dark energy. That's right. And yes. all of this is... Is it, you think we know the universe, just what I've been telling you about. We know very little about this universe, about this, what's it all about. Now, we're going to talk about this more in our next program, look at it out in detail, okay, folks, and what we may discover and so on. But believe you me, there's vast numbers of things to discover. Yes. So I'm going to have to shut up now because we're just coming up to, to 10 o'clock, but I'm going to catch up with you in the very near future. So cheerio, folks. Keith? Yep. Thank uh, you, Richard. I, I'm sure he's going to be here next time as well. Yes, okay, probably. Okay, okay. bye.